Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ryan Steck. I'm the artistic director at Art Engine. Um, I'm here with uh, Cheryl Lerondel today uh, to talk about um, her project in the Entanglements uh, exhibition, which is currently on, uh, well, maybe by the time you watch this, it won't be on anymore, but it's on at uh, the Carchemesson Gallery uh, here in Ottawa. And so we have uh, Cheryl here uh, to talk about uh, this piece, which is the um, uh, really a world premiere. Uh, first time it's being shown anywhere. It was, I think, um, we put uh, finishing touches on it just before the 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 people walked in the door at the gallery. So uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to to be showing it here uh, and to have you here in Ottawa uh, down to to talk about the the project. Um, so I have a few questions for you, and then maybe we'll get some questions from some of our. Uh, our friends who've joined us here. Uh, it was really great to hear about um, the story of how this, this, this piece evolved. Um, and I think one of the things, um, you know, one of the things we set out to do in this, uh, in the project with my curator, uh, Selena Jeffrey, my co-curator, <laughs> she's not curating me. Uh, <laughs> although that's sometimes necessary. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> But one of the things that we talked a lot about and what we set out to do um, was to think about the role of uh, art and politics together, particularly in the current climate crisis. Uh, and one of those, uh, you know, the, the, the evolving dialogue we have or the challenges is uh, what is the audience experience of these things? There's the, the, the artist's um, consideration there's our consideration in, in all of these sets of ideas. Um, but for you, what do you hope um, that the audience gets from the experience of it? Because there's a lot of the story, there's an incredible backstory. And I wonder how you think about um, what a person coming into the installation uh, is meant to have access to or how you, how you understand their experience and think about that. It's a good, it's a good question. I, I... I think that um, people will always read and into work and take away what they take away. Um, but one of the things that I notice about being in the installation, even you know, even though I'm the creator, the artist who made the work, is that, um, and we've discussed this, is that there's being inside the falls as you are. It's it's almost it would be like an impossible place. You can't actually be there. You, the way the falls are constructed and the way the barriers are, you know, you're up much uh, up much higher. You know, so all of a sudden it affords you this ability to be immersed, you know, in the falls. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because we are always immersed in the falls. The fact that all of the electricity that we've got going on is thank you to the falls. But in this ability to be in this space, in the gallery, and to have the falls all around you, um, it, hopefully it's just another way to remind people that those falls are even a being unto themselves, you know? And you're with a being. You're with a water being, a very great water being. And as you um, so uh, importantly reminded me this summer when I was visiting was that the falls were the second loudest falls in North America. So even the sound that we have in the gallery is, is much muted compared to what they would have normally been. And we probably hear cars honking and engines revving and um, much more than we actually hear those falls. And that wouldn't have been the case 100 or 200 years ago. We would have heard those falls. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm hoping that it's a, an immersive experience. I'm also hoping that in some way that the eel wall is is a bit of an enigma. It's a bit of a mystery. Mm. And um, uh, I, it could have been much more didactic. It could have been much more prescriptive. Um, but I, it hopefully, I don't know, I think sometimes art has that ability to kind of make people dream and to ponder and to wonder and to make one's own connections. And um, mm. I think it's just the beginning as well in some way. You yeah. Know? Do you think, is that, is that a way of working for you or uh, is it something in this particular case like 
because these these stories are 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 absolutely fascinating and compelling, and certainly from um, even my perspective as a as as experiencing it or as a co curator in the show, like wanting to offer the public to be able to follow these threads to pull them off. Uh, is it something that you felt that just feels right for this piece, or is that something for you that these <clears throat> threads of politics that maybe come off of your work are you sort of they're like uh, little Easter eggs or nuggets to for for some to follow, but it's not always as important as the experience of the work itself. Well, I think there's a there is that notion of a narrative thread, and there's always dangling threads, and there's always. Uh, you know, in any artist's practice, just looking at your journal, if you're writing, you're going to choose one, and you're going to go on that, and you're going to make a work about that. But there's still those other dangling threads that you didn't choose, right? So the same thing would work for um, somebody experiencing an artwork, that they're going to take what they take out of it. But uh, it might, if you're an artist, inspire you to make work. It might, if you, you know... Uh, you know, have another role in society or in life that you might also follow that thread. And so I think trying to leave it open so that people can mm -hmm. follow those threads as they need to. And you never know how they come back. It's quite interesting how things yeah. loop back, you know. Do you, do you think, do you find that more challenging these days? I know that, again, part of the direction we were uh, undertaking in the in in this was thinking about what's, the artist's role in the climate crisis, that this crisis is <laughs> like, it has become so much more critical um, for sort of uh, human survival on the planet, as well as many, many uh, other species uh, and ecosystems entangled with us. Yeah, I think, I think, I think you and Selena were right in sort of, you know, having that be one of the questions that's being asked of this work, because you know, we're all implicated. It doesn't matter if we're a painter or a drawer or a printmaker or somebody who works in technology. We're all part of what's in essentially going wrong mm -hmm. with the planet, you know. Um, I'm reminded of um, one of my mentors, uh, the late uh, elder uh, sh and artist, uh, Shirley Bear, who just passed away, I think, a week ago. And it was Shirley used to always remind me, um, and this, this is really, it was foundational in, in work that I made for decades afterwards, and she would say, to do things for the healing of Mother Earth and all her beings, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it, it gave me a different MO, you know. And in fact, this, was, this, ex, this piece was quite excruciating because the amount of technology and the amount of electricity it's using to tell a story about how we're... We're creating lives for beings mm -hmm. so that we can use more technology and more electricity. Yeah. So it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a tough one. I really appreciate it, though, in, in the talk you used the word implicated and you said it again there. And I think we've been struggling, I think, to find different ways to say entanglement. <laughs> and I, I think that's one that uh, actually does almost turn it up even a little bit more that it's a little less passive in thinking that it's just a matter of, you know, us being woven together, but we are uh, implicated in sort of the safety or the future, or you know, we are implicated in both harm and good. There's a, there's a, there's quite a, it's quite a lot in in thinking about how are you implicated in these, in these things. I wonder if we could uh, talk a bit more about uh, the idea of the the that you've you know sort of discussed in your in your artist statement you touched a bit on it here in terms of a, a sort of Cree worldview and how that sort of shapes this piece or maybe also your 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 practice so as I mentioned during the talk when the when the eels very rightly said words within words you know that we know that even these small sound shapes um, are indicative of other other uh, understandings of how we're all related and there's a good word. There's a good phrase in uh, Cree, "we tap um, you know, um, and it means tied together, like being tied together, and it sort of helps us to understand that we're all tied together, and we're tied together to um, through like um, 
miopamatsu anokitsi for for a good life, for a healthy good life, life affirming, you know. And and what are we tied together to and how and with? It's nigawiaski or ogawi mao, so Mother Earth, you know. So that's kind of a basic Cree understanding is that there's this intrinsic interrelationship between us. And if we don't recognize that we're actually all tied together, it doesn't matter that there's no word in my language for eel, you mm -hmm. know? Mm. It doesn't matter that there's no word in my language for a, a bug that lives in the Amazon rainforest. We all are intrinsically tied together. And, and it, it is that sort of, um, uh, I know that there's some, uh, some issues with the notion of sort of a natural order in some philosophies around the world, but from within a Cree worldview, that's kind of a really tenuous balance that needs to be really maintained. And that's why in, in you know, in northern Saskatchewan, uh, where I live now, those ceremonies still happen because it's, it's, it's uh, that recognition that there's things that we need to kind of do seasonally and annually because they're part of helping the earth to keep turning. In the same way that in a, in a contemporary city urban sense, you know, protest is important and speaking up and understanding that uh, our voices en masse have the ability to make change, you know. So these are all things that are Im implicit in, in, um, in that sort of dynamism, you know. So that would be from a Cree world, view, that notion of interrelatedness. Do you feel like in works like this, there is a sense of, uh, for you, not only, um, say, receiving a worldview from a heritage, but also that the art making is an active part of shaping um, and, and handing off a worldview to others? I, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that, um, uh, I think it's probably much more poignant in some ways that work doesn't just become an, uh, an object of a commodity but it becomes an, uh, an object or an event that actually propels discussion, um, new work, new activism, and, and future work. I think, you know, that's, that's a success as an artist if you know that, you know, that the work actually does something more than just become a commodity in someone's wall in their mm -hmm. home. Do you, do you think also there's something, is there, I don't want to divide it up as if there is like, uh, part of your brain that is Korean, and there's a part that's, uh, but, you know, how, how, in terms of the interspecies communication, uh, do you think there's something within the language, uh, a Cree language that is lending itself to, to be able to listen in a different way um, than, say, like the sort of Anglophone side of your brain? Well, you know, I, I, I always tell the story of a, a colleague um, who, uh, who's Lebanese, um, whose family emigrated to Canada, and without saying their name, because if I tell their story wrong, that's a, that's a problem. But, <laughs> uh, but they told me once they were in Lebanon and they were listening to somebody uh, speak on the phone, and that person was speaking in three languages in the course of one short conversation. They were speaking French, English, and Arabic in one short conversation on the phone, and they were listening. And they said afterwards, they said, why did you speak in three languages? And the person said, I speak French when I want to be descriptive. I speak Arabic when I want to kind of really give the feeling of what it is I'm saying. And I'm using English to just for the data, just to say the time and the date and the place. And so I think that's something that we're mm -hmm. starting to realize. All languages etymologically have those sound shapes that are deeply connected to the earth. But sadly, some of the languages, and most notably probably uh, the European languages, and English is because it was a great imperial power for so long, became a language of commodity, a language of ownership, a language of... And so it became, it's become that, I mean, it, even in us speaking right now in this language. So I think the thing about indigenous uh, worldviews is that there still is that deep, deep connection, you know, and those sound shapes actually are very, very connected. Like in, uh, for example, pe in, from the word pe meze, the Anishinaabe word for the eel, pe in my language means to cut across. It's sort of a direction of cutting across. And so when you think about those eels, you know, they're kind of doing that beautiful little switch back as they, so for me, I would go, oh, that's, that's part of the pe of what they're doing. They're kind of 
doing that, you know? So um, I think I hope that answered your mm -hmm. question. I, I, to go there, you talked about, go a little further on to the sort of, let's say, the, the opposite side of this act of speaking and, and, and communicating, but you talked about listening. You know, uh, can you talk a little bit more about listening as it relates to language for you and then art making as well? Well, I think there's a, a, that uh, uh, attunement component. And that's what I experienced with the interspecies communicators is that they were very attuned to, to everything, you know, that it was more than just the words and it was more than the sound shapes. It was also how they reverberated against the walls and how they sort of impacted the body and how they made us feel, you know. Um, so I think that's an important part. Um, you know, we can we could very easily sort of become attuned to sounds and then go make work about it. But then you have to ask, how is it making change in the world or how is it contributing to, to regaining that balance? You know? So I think that's kind of a responsibility then. It's not, it's not the ability to listen in and of itself. It's the ability to listen and then make that be some sort of meaningful contribution that makes, you know, makes that balance less tenuous. Uh, I, I wanted to move a bit to talk about uh, the sort of regionalism of the work and the site specificity and how that, I mean, how was that experience for you in terms of, uh, I think you captured a lot of different complexities around this, uh, the, the region and the site itself. Uh, but how is it to work on, on a site? Was this a very different sort of process for you being so far away and especially travel being what it is during the the COVID times that we're in, uh, you know, how how is that sort of understanding of region and, and, and site and space? I was really happy. I came here this summer and we spent some time uh, there in this in the space itself. That really helped because if you've, you know, those of you that live here and, and ever walk across that bridge uh, and if you go in, there's lovely places to sit right at the falls and just that booming, booming sound of the falls really did help to, to allow me to be there, to be very present with the falls. Um, I normally would, uh, outside of uh, the last couple of years in this pandemic, I normally would have just come for a week or two mm. and, and just actually been that had this daily uh, visitation. I also... Um, I mean, the work, if it had gone another way, I would have spent, been spending a lot more time in the indigenous community and having sort of those stories become the stories that the work was about. So this was a very different uh, way to work for me, but I think it was almost serendipitous in a really interesting way that it was, you know, the, the custodians of that river that I needed to actually speak with was the eels, you know. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, it, it worked out in a, in a very... Atypical way, but good way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks for sharing uh, the work and all the stories that came to bring the work to be. I'm like uh, very, very uh, delighted to have it uh, here in our city, and I hope it has a, a life that keeps going from beyond here. Uh, I think what we'll do now is we do have some uh, guests uh, joining us, and we have uh, maybe some questions from, from people here. Uh, so we'll do that that part now and uh, yeah I, I anything I didn't ask you, do you want no to I, I, I I might just add that I think that um, already when the eels told me to you know sort of take a risk and go outside of my scope I I've, I've made it sort of um, part now that whenever I'm speaking and I've had a couple opportunities uh, that I sort of do these interventions where I just start speaking on behalf of the eels I know that sounds wrong. Uh, maybe we'll have to edit that. Um, so delete that from your brain. I'm not speaking on behalf of the eels. I think what I'm trying to do now is make create these small interventions where I'm discussing the plight of the eels in places where I normally wouldn't. Normally, and so that's for me something new, and I'm glad that the eels told me, you know. So I would also then maybe say in that sort of notion, please make a comment or say something or let's have a discussion because that's what the eels are asking of us. They're asking us to consider, consider them. 
They did uh, say, and they didn't say it verbatim in the communication, but essentially the sentiment was that, uh, and this is kind of a mic drop, they said, uh, if we go, you go. So that's something we really need to take into consideration, that as there are these mass extinctions happening now, and the eels are like right on the precipice, you know, that we need to really start to understand how we're really implicated in this, that you know, our, our, our waters aren't clean anymore, you know, um, and upstream and downstream, you know, what's happening and what's going to happen to us. So, so please let's uh, talk about eels or art or anything. <laughs> I want to thank you uh, so much for uh, your generosity this afternoon. Uh, it's been lovely to hear uh, uh, all, of, all, of, all about this. Obviously, I could just keep talking. Um, but but uh, uh, we'll wrap it up here and, uh, and uh, take the conversation into another kind of direction. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate getting to visit and uh, spend a bit of time here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.